Holly Gibson, direct to source. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, as always, from ATS, we uh, we are we love the idea of sustainability, uh, and very excited to have one of the key players in that movement uh, for the for to be a good uh, role model and uh, a guide for a lot of the people and professionals in the industry. Uh, so today you're talking to us about how to build sustainability into your brand. Uh, it's going to be a very important topic moving forward as it has been for the last few years. So um, the, full, the virtual floor is yours. I want to let everybody know that we, will, we do have a chat function. Um, if you're watching on Facebook Live, go ahead and ask your questions there and uh, we'll do our best to feed them over into the chat and Q&A panel um, on here, over here on Zoom. So we'll, we'll tackle those at the end of uh, Holly's presentation and you are good to go, my dear. Great. Hi everybody and thanks for joining our talk today. I'm gonna put up a presentation here and then I will hop back on um, live when we go to the Q&A portion. So this is me underwater doing what I'd really always rather be doing. I'm an avid scuba diver and that's one of the things that really reinforced my idea and my belief that we really should be responsible stewards of our planet. The gentleman in the motorcycle is my partner Tulio and he's got a real passion for helping change people's lives. We've been in this business for about 30 years and spent the last 14 working on sustainable brands. I actually started out on the design side. I started out as a pattern maker and then was a designer and then running teams of designers. And I crossed over to the dark side of production about a dozen years ago. I've worked in large corporations and startups. I've run production domestically in the US and in dozens of countries around the globe. I'm really passionate about helping brands grow. And I serve as the vice president, uh, vice chairman of the board for the Denver Design Incubator, which is a nonprofit that I helped found, which supports the apparel industry in Colorado. Tulio and I built Direct to Source as a triple bottom line company focused on people and planet in addition to profits. We saw that we had an opportunity to make a real difference for brands interested in sustainable production at the same time as making a difference in the lives of the people who actually sew the clothing. So, oops. So here's what I'm not gonna do today. I'm not gonna spout a ton of industry buzzwords or throw certifications or acronyms at you. I'm not gonna tell you that you have to join all of these organizations. I'm not gonna tell you have to redesign your entire collection, and repurpose your brand to be 100% organic or 100% recycled. You're successful because your customers already like what you're doing. I don't want you to change everything. I just want you to think today about starting by making a decision. Decide to be better. The journey to having a more sustainable brand, it's really just that, it's a journey. It's not a sprint and there is no finish line. Even Patagonia, widely recognized as one of the most sustainable brands, they will freely admit that they have a long way to go. We traditionally have one of the least sustainable industries on the planet, right? Textile mills have polluted the environment, sewing factories have oppressed and taken advantage of workers, and the throwaway nature of fast fashion in particular has contributed to landfill overruns. But there is a real steam building to turn our industry around. I mean, it's a really exciting time for our industry. Don't you wanna be part of that? And it all starts with a decision and then an action to make your brand better. And once you start, just don't stop, just keep going. Here's what you're not gonna do. This is where you get into trouble. Consumers are really becoming more aware when brands are simply greenwashing and not being transparent. Most consumers really do appreciate honesty and transparency. And as we just said, it's really impossible to be a 100% sustainable brand. I mean, our industry exists to sell a lot of product. So we are inherently at odds with a certain level of sustainability. So aim to be a better brand, a responsible brand. Just be honest with your customers about where you are in your journey to better your brand as you become more sustainable. And here's the great thing about that. It really gives you an ever unfolding story to talk to your consumers about your brand every time you achieve new milestones in your journey. A little overwhelmed? The whole subject of sustainability really can be overwhelming. For some brands like Patagonia, right? It's built into their DNA. For others like guests, they're racing to catch up. 
right? Guess is a multi, is a fashion brand who until recently wasn't really thinking significantly about sustainability. They're starting with a multi-year plan just to educate themselves and their workforce on the issues. And this is before they begin any significant implementation. It's much harder to turn the bus around when you're very large and you've been going the other direction. So while it's good to talk about what the big brands are doing, so much of what they do and how they do it doesn't translate well if you're a small or a mid-sized brand. So let's just talk for a moment about how the big brands are tackling the subject of sustainability. Many big brands have a sustainability officer, maybe even an entire department that are experts on different aspects along with the science behind it. Patagonia has R&D labs that specifically work on making their products more sustainable. Big brands join expensive organizations like the Textile Exchange or the Sustainable Apparel Co Coalition. They go to the big sustainability conferences where government agencies are tackling really big issues with NGOs and nonprofits. Big brands have big orders. That means they can dictate to the factories how they want them to behave and what rules they want them to comply with. Big brands have folks whose entire job it is to travel to factories that they're using and make sure they're in compliance. Big brands buy big quantities of fabric, right? So if you're gonna buy 100,000 yards or a million yards of fabric, it's pretty easy to say, hey, we'd like that polyester to be recycled instead of virgin, but what can you do as a small or a mid-sized brand? You may not have all the knowledge necessary. It might simply be too expensive and too time consuming to travel to all those conferences. You might just be trying to find a factory that'll give you quality work and on-time delivery. You might just be trying to figure out how to increase your sales so you don't have trouble meeting mill MOQs. So let's talk about what you can do. I said before that the first thing you need to do is make a decision to be better. It really just starts with awareness. It's that simple. I'm a firm believer in knowing is better than not knowing. So what are some of the options you have internally in your office? Are you recycling? Do you turn the lights off when you leave the room? What about your packaging? What about your carbon footprint? This isn't the kind of stuff you need a science degree to understand. So much of it is really just common sense. By being aware and assessing your options, you can pretty quickly pick off some low-hanging fruit to make your company more sustainable in pain-free ways. You'll notice here that I am looking at sustainability holistically, not just are you using organic fabrics. So let's say you've done your self-assessment here. You become aware of what you're doing that's better and what you might be doing that's not so great. It's a huge first step, so really pat yourself on the back, but don't stop there. Now you can start looking at some of the things that are harder. You don't have to tackle everything at once. Remember, this is a journey. If you know that your fabric isn't sustainable, you can look to see if there is a better option that will still work for you from performance, price, and availability perspective. If you don't know if your factory has ethical treatment of their workers or pays a living wage, ask some questions. If you don't like their answers or if they don't answer you, then you've learned something. Based upon where you are and what options you have, tackle the projects one at a time. If you don't like the answers from your factory, maybe it's time to start talking to others. If you're using virgin polyester, maybe you can find the same fabric or a very similar fabric that uses recycled polyester. Maybe changing your packaging is an easier place to start for your company. There's no right or wrong place to start. Just go. So let's look at some of these areas in greater detail. Technology is really a driver in this subject of sustainability. So it may not be practical or prudent to convert all your products to sustainable today, but as technology continues to evolve, you'll have more and more options. Right? I told you I've been doing this for 14 years now, and when I started this journey, we already had recycled polyester on the market. It existed, it was out there. You could buy fabric with recycled polyester. Of course, it was super expensive and it was pretty gross. It was scratchy, it was itchy, it looked terrible, like nobody would wanna wear it, but it was there. But today, it's amazing, it's beautiful, it feels fantastic. It's a completely different story. Price is only nominally more. The green shirt in the corner up here is made from recycled plastic bottles and people can't believe it when they touch it, it's so soft. So just stay aware, technology will make the journey easier over time. A couple of other examples of things just coming out in the market, Spinova, is a brand new fiber that was just announced, I think a few weeks ago. They've developed a way to turn wood pulp into fabric without using all the chemicals. Pretty cool. Recycled spandex is another, frankly, pretty new innovation. It was actually first announced in 2014, but it's still not been widely adopted. It's still very hard to get, but it's coming. 
these kinds of new technologies and new fibers really are being focused on big brands and big fiber manufacturers and yarn manufacturers and fabric manufacturers. So this is good for all of us. As, as the testing is done on these, as the bigger brands are interested in them, as they become more readily available, they will be available in the market and it'll trickle down and you'll have access to those things too. So let's start with fabrics because that's always a big one. There's really a lot of choices today for better, more sustainable fabrics. Recycled polyester, recycled nylon, bamboo, organic cotton. How do you make sense of it and how do you choose? Well, if you start out and pick what your mindset about sustainability is first, it'll be a lot easier. What is most important to your product and your brand? What is the best fit with your brand's DNA? And it's really a little different for every brand. Here's an example. Brand A, their mindset is all about recycling. To them, recycling is their keystone to sustainability. They use recycled boxes to ship everything. They try to have a zero waste office. They have composting. So it makes sense for them that their products would be recycled. So they sell t-shirts made from a recycled polyester blended with a recycled cotton. All their customers are interested in recycling too and they love these t-shirts. Brand B has a totally different mindset. Their brand DNA revolves around their products being seasonless and having a really long lifespan. That's their keystone to sustainability. So should they also make a recycled cotton, recycled polyester t-shirt? Well, Cotton is a short staple fiber. Recycled cotton is even shorter. What does that mean? It means it pills. It's okay for brand A because it fits their brand DNA. 100% recycled is their badge of honor. A few pills on their shirt are not perceived as a quality issue. But that doesn't really work for brand B. They, they remember their mindset is long lifespan. Their customers are going to perceive pilling after a few wears as a quality issue. And a shirt with three wears and then to the landfill isn't really sustainable if you look at it holistically, so it doesn't match brand B's mindset. So how might brand B build a better, more sustainable shirt than their old virgin polyester regular cotton shirt, but keeping with their mindset that longevity is most important? Well, they have different choices. They might make an all cotton shirt, which is compostable. They might switch to organic cotton, which is even better. They might switch to recycled polyester. Any of these choices or a combination will give them better, more sustainable product with a long lifespan. So you see, you have choices and the right choice for brand A might be very different than for brand B or C or Z. Now to the sewing factory. This is where we really get into social sustainability. Do you know who your factory is? Does your factory actually sew your orders or do they outsource them to somebody else? Do the people who sew your clothes look like the little boy in the bottom picture? When you're a large company with large orders, you have leverage over the factories. You have a team that audits them and you have folks in the factory all the time. You get a pretty good sense of what they're doing. It's much harder when you're a smaller brand. You can visit them once or twice, hope that they have an open door policy, hope that they're doing the right things. I told you before, I'm a believer that uh, in knowing is better than not knowing. And your goal here is to get better. It's not to be perfect today. The factory on the top with the yellow shirts, that's a picture of our new building that we built last year. When we built DTS, we took a look at everything we knew about production and the way we've been doing it for 30 years. And we decided to try to turn everything on its head, look at it through a new lens and see if there was a better way to do it. And in all honesty, a lot of our industry colleagues kind of thought we were nuts. They're like, you're gonna spend all your money and <laughs> you're not gonna make it. But we really had faith built upon experience in the industry and a passion for it. The very first thing we did was to get rid of the big bulletin board that hangs in the entrance of many factories. When workers show up on Monday morning, if their name is on the board, they get to sit down and sew that week because there's work for them. If it's not on the board, then they've got to go down the street to the next factory and hope that there's work there or just go home and not work. All of our employees are full-time permanent. We didn't set up traditional factory lines where every operator is trained on one position. The left sleeve person sews the left sleeve on all day, every day, every week, every month. And if the right sleeve person is absent, the left sleeve person can't fill in because they don't know how to sew a right sleeve. They only know how to sew a left sleeve. We set up a flexible modular system based upon the Toyota sewing system. It gives us a lot of flexibility. It did require months of intensive training. Now we can sew many kinds of products ranging from t-shirts and hoodies to men's dress shirts and men's dress pants. And our modular system allows us to be flexible to different sizes of orders. 
we can form a more traditional line to maximize productivity or be breaking, breaking up the line into small modules to digest smaller orders. And we don't pay on piece rate, we pay a living wage plus bonuses for productivity and quality as well as paid vacation time. So here is the interesting thing though. We have a team that really loves what they do and take pride in their work. We have a team that feels valued. We have virtually no turnover. And because of all of that, our productivity has skyrocketed. Now, instead of the traditional six day work week, we only work five days a week and our throughput is the same. Everyone gets an extra day off each week to spend with their families or pursue school or other personal interests. And our colleagues who thought we were crazy, many of them have come in to ask what we're doing and see it and find out how. And a couple of them are even starting to emulate some of the things we're doing in their own factories. And we feel really blessed to be able to have been a change agent there. But we're just like you. We're always looking to see what we can do better. So here's the dirty secret, right? Right now, all of our cutting scraps go to the landfill. I know, it's terrible. We were looking at a biomass system. We thought, oh, this would be perfect. Help power the factory, use less energy and electric, and get rid of the cutting scraps. But we kind of, in talking to some people and doing some studies, realized that maybe that wasn't the best choice because of the additional air pollution that that was going to create. So now we're planning, we found a fabric shredding machine that um, we can feed all of the cutting scraps into. It will mat them, shred the fabric and mat it. And then we can sew the edges, which will make blankets or sleeping mats. And we're going to partner with a nonprofit to distribute those to people in need. It's a long-term plan. It costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of logistics to make it happen, but we're on the journey. Let's talk packaging. How much plastic is in your packaging? It's standard in this industry to wrap each individual garment in a single use plastic bag. This is often a really easy place to start reducing. Unless otherwise requested by our customers, we ship each carton with just one plastic bag covering all the units in that carton. We need that for the moisture barrier to protect the clothing, but it's one bag now in a carton instead of 48 or 72. Part of this though, as a brand, really um, requires educating your customers. I know a sustainable brand, I mean, it was about 10 years ago, so things are a little better now, but they had decided to get rid of single use plastic and ship like we do with one in, in the carton. They sent a fairly large shipment to a prominent retailer who requested to return the entire shipment because it was second quality. And they got it back and their QC people went through it and they're like, there's nothing wrong with this product. And so as a test, they repackaged exactly the same garments in individual plastic bags, sent them back to the retailer, and the retailer accepted them as first quality goods because they were all fine now. So think on that one for a minute. Carbon footprint is a big one, of course. Um, so everybody's knee-jerk reaction to that one is always, let's make everything where we are. Let's make it all in the U.S. Let's make it all in Canada. That doesn't always work, right? It, that can be very expensive to do. So good for some products, not for everything. Um, we do so much in Asia and India. That's a really big carbon footprint, right? It's three months on a boat. Central America, Mexico can be a great way to reduce your overall carbon footprint. And think about it holistically, just like we keep talking, right? So I'll give you another example. I know um, a ski brand in Denver, and they make all of their ski coats and ski pants in China. And, and for right now, at least, it needs to stay there. That's where they get the quality. That's who has the specialty in making that kind of product. But when they looked at it holistically, they realized that they could make their tees and their flannel shirts in Central America and get great quality, great pricing, exactly what they needed. And so they've reduced their overall carbon footprint as a company by doing that. It's also to mention overproduction, right? I, when I started in this business almost 30 years ago, we didn't have a outlet malls, like that didn't exist. We produced most of our stuff in the US and we produced according to what retailers ordered. And when most of the production went offshore, minimums got higher, the lead times got longer. And so brands started habitually overproducing because what if their customers wanted to reorder, right? They couldn't place a second order and get it in time. And the extra product that didn't sell had to go somewhere, so we built outlet malls. But there are ways to do production differently. We've developed a program with some of our customers that allows for more just-in-time. We keep a small amount of key fabrics and trims in stock. Instead of ordering large quantities seasonally, they order smaller quantities on a monthly or an every other month basis. It's really a win-win for everyone. We sew smaller orders, but we're sewing consistently. 
They get regular shipments, means they don't have to have a warehouse that's as large, and it means that they don't have product that they have to mark down because every month the orders are changing in terms of the sizing, in terms of the colors, in terms of the quantities, in terms of the exact style that they're getting orders from their customers for. So it enables them to be much more responsive to their customers without holding a lot of inventory. Now the $64 million question, is it gonna cost more to be a sustainable brand? Uh, the short answer is, yeah, it's going to cost you a little more, but it is important. It's important to our industry. It's important to our customers. It's important to the people that sew the clothing and grow the cotton. And it's important to the planet. Remember, you don't have to do everything at once. Just take baby steps and keep going. When we started out five years ago making this new fabric, we made it with um, Reprieve, Recycled Polyester, and Regular Cotton. And over time, we've been able to change that to BCI cotton, which is the Better Cotton Initiative. It's a better cotton. And you know what? It only costs 15 cents more a garment for our customer to do that. 15 cents, that was a price that they could absorb. And you might say, well, why didn't you switch to organic cotton? Because organic cotton is a lot more expensive and that didn't work for our customer, it increased the price of their product too much. So everything has a balance. And you know what? If you come at it from a heart of wanting to do better, then you'll continue to make better decisions. You'll continue to become a more sustainable brand. You are a sustainable brand and you're becoming a sustainable brand all at the same time. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And who has questions? Sorry about that. I had trouble logging back on. I always lose the window. All right. <laughs> we do have one question here. How can I watch the building sustainability into your, oh, hold on. Oh, I think she's asking if she can watch it after the fact. Um, these should all be available afterwards. After every show, we make them available to, uh, to all the attendees. We do record them, so. Uh, let's see here. Don't have any other questions here at the moment. Um, Holly, is there some contact information you'd be willing to provide? Um, any of our attendees who would have any questions for you moving forward? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you can go to our website. You can contact through email. Uh, we have a booth in the apparel exhibitor hall. Website is www direct to source d-i-r-e-c-t-o-s-o-u-r-c-e.com and you can email us through our website as well um here is somebody asking keeping as much uh, as possible close to their own backyard and staying in the usa that can be a great choice depending on your product right one of the challenges about sewing in the usa frankly is our minimum wage is so high um, and most sewing factories, whether it's ours in Guatemala or whether it's a sewing factory in the U.S., will have different tiers of sewers, right? When someone's starting out, they're paid minimum wage, but as they grant, grow in their experience and skills and quality and speed, they get paid higher. So some of these sewers and factories actually get paid quite a bit of money. Um, if you have a product that is doesn't take a lot of minutes to sew, right? All sewing pricing is based upon how many minutes does it take to sew this. So the fewer seams, the less time it takes to sew it. And so if you have products that um, don't have a lot of sewing, like leggings can be done really easily in the United States, um, simple products like that, then you can understand that if you wanna produce in the US or frankly produce in Canada, your, your product has to be in the higher price point. Um, but that can work for some brands. There's uh, a brand in um, it, here in Colorado called Corbeau, and they actually um, sew everything in the U.S. and their base layer of ski gear. It's very high end, sustainable, eco friendly, and they sew beautiful product um, in the U.S. So some things you can, some things you can't. So maybe you also think about a blended carbon footprint. Maybe some products you can produce here, and some you might need to produce near shore. Um, and for example. From Central America to the US, we're talking days on a boat instead of months on a boat. So it's a pretty good carbon footprint. 
Um, here's another question. Three actionable steps in becoming a sustainable brand, small scale brands involved. You know, start easy, start with the low hanging fruit. Like I said before, really look at sustainability holistically. You know, does your office recycle? Does your office use single use water bottles, right? I know a company who wanted to become more sustainable and they just looked at how many water bottles were in the trash at the end of the week. And they're like, well, this is an easy one. We can put coolers in and everybody gets a custom branded, really nice water bottle uh, with their company's brand on it. And they reduced their garbage and their recycling tremendously. So I would say start easy and start small. And then look at the different aspects of fabric, of production, of carbon footprint, of packaging and decide where can I go next and what can I knock off next and what's realistic for my brand. And that's, I would really say that's two and three. And then just do some assessments, right? Just keep tracking. What are you doing and what do I want to do next? Okay. Uh, we have a couple others that just came in while you were speaking. Um, how does your factory practice sustainability in regards to dyeing fabric? That is a good question. Um, we actually work uh, for the fabric we make and we make probably 80 percent of the fabric that we actually sew so we um, do that in a dye house that has top of the line uh, new technology dye machines that actually use less water they're ecologic dye machines they also have their own water treatment plant uh, and so all of the water is treated on site uh, to required levels before it's released back out into the environment. And one of the things that we do with a lot of our fabrics is dye them in a heather color. Not only is heather really fashionable, but if you think about this, if you have a polyester and a cotton and you want to union dye it into a solid color, then that takes two different dye stuffs because cotton takes one kind and polyester takes another. And so by dyeing only one fiber, we can use half the amount of dye and half the amount of water um, to dye the different fabrics. Great. All right. Uh, we have a couple more that came in. From Fernando, do you take old fabrics to use for your recycled fabrics? Um, we don't because that's not actually the way it works yet. Um, so in terms of, let's say you have a garment and you're going to go recycle that garment again. So currently, if you have a 100% polyester garment, and this is still pretty new, um, and it has to have, it has to be 100% polyester, can have lycra, can have any other fibers, you have to take off all the buttons and the trims, they actually can take that. Um, Unify is working on a program with a couple of different brands, and they can take that and melt it down and recycle it again. But for blends, like if you have a poly cotton, there's currently not a way to take that old garment that was a poly cotton, chop it up and reuse it into another garment. There are companies out there who will downcycle it or upcycle it, depending on which way, and turn it into other products. They'll shred it and put it in jog bedding. They'll um, do other things with it, make sleeping mats with it like we were gonna do, or we are gonna do eventually. But there's not actually a way to un- knit all the fabric and reuse those yarns for a, another apparel product. Okay. Uh, Holly, is your company a manufacturer? If so, where are you located? We are a manufacturer. We have offices in the U.S. Our factory is in Guatemala. Um, my partner lives in Guatemala. He's in the factory every day. And we help brands from design and development through full package production. Um, and then if you're in the US, since we have an office here, we can also handle importation into the US. If you're not in the US, pricing is all FOB Guatemala. Fantastic. And then one more we have here on at the average retail price will be, I think they're trying to get, um, trying to get some advice here. Average retail is what it says. Average retail price will be $89 to $212. Need to work the math backward. Do we need to work the math, math backwards with you from Gina? Um, you know, easy enough. If you know what your end price point is, it's really great because then you can develop it that's going to fit in that price point. So um, again, I started out on the design side before I went over to production. So I've seen it from both ends. So we're really, that's one of the things we're really good at is helping brands create product that they can retail for what they need to retail it for. That's the correct quality that they need. Um, and 
yeah, we can absolutely help you do that. Okay. I think that is, here we go. I think we have one more come in. Any suggestions for packaging types as an alternative to poly bags that can withstand shipping slash rain? Technology is our friend here and there's new stuff coming out on the market all the time. Um, and so most packaging companies are starting to either offer a recycled plastic bag, right, which is way better than virgin, or there are other, um, I've seen compostable bags coming out that are resistant to moisture and would be appropriate for shipping bags. Um, they're in search, I believe Ecologic makes a bag. There's a number of different packaging companies out there now that are developing offerings that are um, perfect. So just Google it and you'll find actually a lot of options today. Great. Um, and then one more came in. Can you get peace silk? I have a line of captains I am creating from also, also from Juno. Um, we do not make peace silk in Central America, but there are some fibers that we don't make there. And there are times that we will bring fibers in from other, other countries or fabri finished fabrics in from other countries. And so from that, so we, like I said, we make most of the fabric that we sew, but not all of it. The rest of it we buy from other mills. All right, I think that'll do it for Q and A. Um, Holly, thank you so much again for, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, very informative as always. Um, and thank you to everybody that's watching on Facebook and here on Zoom. And that will do it for us for day one of ATSV 2020. Thank Thanks you so everyone. much. Have a good one. Bye. We'll see everybody tomorrow.